Good evening, everyone. And let us begin tonight, as we begin all things, with a prayer. This is a reading from St. Luke's Gospel. Now that very day, two of them were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus. And they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place here in these days? And he replied to them, what sort of things? They said to him, the things that happened to Jesus the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, how our chief priests and rulers handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. We were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are! How slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Messiah should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him, stay with us, for it is nearly evening, and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that, while he was with them at table, he took bread and said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they went out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. Heavenly Father, we ask that you be with us as we discuss the breaking of the bread, as we discuss the community gathered in your name, as we discuss the book that describes you. Allow us time to give thanks, to remember, and to celebrate your presence with us today and always. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Strange. I kind of feel a bit like Garrison Keeler in the old days of the Prairie Home Companion, you know, in that mythical Lake Wobegon in, in Minnesota, telling you about the weather. It's springtime in Fullerton. Although you wouldn't know it, it's just like winter. But we need the winter, and we need the rain, and we give thanks to God for it. And also I give thanks to God for gathering you together in, in this weather. It is um, unpleasant and inconvenient, but we gather in unpleasant and inconvenient times. I've been trying in the last several weeks um, to put together a meaningful little course on the liturgy, not really working through the liturgy practically, although I'd like to do some of that tonight, but rather to give some background as to why we gather and what it is that um, brings us together. I think 
the best is to just sort of recap a couple of these ideas, since you maybe weren't all here or didn't all hear um, all the previous talks. The point is that we want to gather together because God gathers us together. And that becomes a most important principle of the liturgy of the mass, of our worship, to convince people of the presence of God in the church and in the liturgy, to convince people of the presence of God in the community that is gathered, the presence of God in the word of scripture that we read and reflect on, to convince people of the presence of God in the Holy Eucharist, the real presence all the time. It is the building that we come to, the building where certainly in the Roman Catholic Church, God and Jesus Christ is, and that's what the red light means next to the tabernacle, the gold box, that Jesus is truly here. And so we come in worship, we come in awe and reverence, we come to the building because God is here. We also come to the assembly because God is with us in the assembly, the body of Christ, his people, the church. We come in buildings that are big and beautiful, and we come in buildings that are smaller and beautiful. We come in buildings that are ugly and terrible. We come in buildings just because our God is an awesome God. And the church, the liturgy, the people reflect all of that. Certainly, if you were to go to Christ's Cathedral, as I've said on a number of occasions, you wouldn't think, oh, this is the most beautiful church I've ever seen. You know, it rivals St. Peter's, it rivals St. Patrick's in New York. The cathedral in Los Angeles, most beautiful church, it rivals St. Peter, it rivals, it might not in beauty, but certainly in awesome space. It's, it's just absolutely is wonderful, both of them the newer cathedrals, both of them are absolutely wonderful because they reflect that our God is awesome and that space is awesome and it's just absolutely wonderful. I have spoken about the necessity of the windows, not clear glass and not even obscure glass, but glass, um, stained glass windows that play games with light and darkness. At Christ Cathedral, the uh, quarterfoils, as they're called, on each window pane. Each one is designed, engineered, to reflect, deflect, and give um, light so that the people inside aren't being baked, and so that there's a wonderful display of light. I often say that they look like Carl's Jr. happy stars, and they do. They just make you happy to look at them. At least they do may make me happy to look at them. And that's an important part of the Catholic Church, just seeing where we are. What are these windows and what do they tell us? These windows at St. Juliana tell us of the life of Christ. Others, various saints. I have no idea how some of those saints are put together. I, I don't mean anatomically, I mean grouped, but they're, they're just um, wonderful to reflect on. And then some churches, maybe the Italian churches like in Boston, um, that first Italian national church in our country it's got about every saint covered in stained glass windows, paintings, statues, you name it, they're there. The point is try to find Christ in that church. But that makes it um, better. What makes us awesome? The unity and the peace that God brings. Listen to our prayers. If you want to know what people believe, listen to the way they pray. And I began um, with the opening prayer, which I believe is really, really important in our liturgy, but often just not even heard, I suppose. What is it that you can say about God? All of the liturgy. The liturgy is our theology. The mass is our theology. Day after day, season after season, mass after mass. What does it say primarily about God? That he is merciful, that he forgives us our sins and that he brings us to everlasting life. That very first part, we have the gathering song for no other reason than to gather, for no other reason than to move a procession from the back of the church to the sanctuary and to praise God in that procession and to find out who the celebrant is and who the important uh, ministers are for the Eucharist. It's kind of sad currently that with the pandemic, 
happening. We haven't returned to altar servers and all of that, but we will. And the cross comes, the candles come, and then the gospel book comes, and then the priest and the deacon come, and, and it's just a wonderful procession of the hierarchy, really, um, in that kind of structure to get the, the group from the back of the church to the sanctuary. Well, that's the high point, isn't it? A nice opening song, rousing and everything. And then we have the greeting, which simply works by greeting you with the peace of God. No need, really, for a hello in the weather, in the weather uh, report and the ball scores, but just a simple greeting of peace from Almighty God. Now that we've gathered together, let's call to mind our sins. Boy, zingo, straight down. And then the wonderful little bit about God, our theology, our understanding of God. That's what theology means. What can we say? May Almighty God forgive us our sins, have mercy on us, and bring us to eternal life. That's the best part, isn't it? I mean, that's just all of a sudden souping up again to know that God is merciful. God does forgive sins. God brings us to eternal life. That's our God. That's our awesome God. That's who God is, and that's what God does. And then we might sing the Gloria even higher again, that wonderful song, a hymn of praise to God. And then we open with a prayer and reflect on the readings. And it's important that we hear the readings because they have to come to us. They're read as our table stories. You wouldn't want grandma or grandpa or dad or whoever tells the stories around the table to be reading the stories, but rather to tell us the stories. We listen to them. And that's a good thing to do, because in listening, we receive. Sometimes we go overboard with new technology. Not only my opinion, but the opinion of lit liturgists. A liturgist is a person who studies the liturgy and knows it in such a way that you'll never win an argument with that person. And I side with those people who think that it's best not to have the um, readings all the time. You might need it for various language groups. There are exceptions, of course. If someone's reading in Spanish and there's a lot of English speakers, have a translation available. Or Vietnamese and there's a lot of English, have a translation available. In dioceses such as ours, Orange, we have a variety of languages and we um, suffer sometimes because there's not that kind of unity in language, so the reading should be available. Where to make it available? On a worship aid, a piece of paper is really good. Sometimes in a place where it can, can be projected. Some people ask, Father, when are you gonna put the um, uh, projections, uh, project the readings uh, uh, at St. Julianus? I really don't have a place to do it. The wall behind uh, is brick, and it, you just cannot project on brick. Can you smooth it out? You're making a, an excuse. We can smooth it out, but then it doesn't fit in with everything else. Also, is the sanctuary the best place to be um, uh, to, to, to broadcast the readings, to have the readings on, uh, available on, on the screen? I don't think so. And so we can't do it there. We'd have to take down the statues here. There's just simply not a place to do it here. And for that reason, or other reasons too, we don't make the um, projections of the readings or of the songs. But we're interested in our God, who is merciful, full of forgiveness, and promises eternal life. And we're interested in qualities and characteristics of church. Not that God looks on our sins, we say, but rather on the unity and peace of the church. May God grant us unity and peace. And that's an important thing. We gather together in unity, not to be doing private devotions. That may have taken place at a different time, but with the new mass, private devotions really don't have a place. Rather, the new mass is what we concentrate on because it's in our language, mostly. And it's to be a part of unity and peace. And you can find a lot of what I've spoken about 
in the first of the documents of Vatican Council II, Sacrosantum Concilium, which is always an initialed SC, or simply called the Constitution of the Sacred Liturgy. And this constitution, this change of the liturgy, really started in the early 1900s, and it made a lot of progress. It made a lot of changes. Some people maybe thought that there was just an insane itching for novelty and various pastoral needs, and so the chains came about because of just novelty. Pastoral needs become important because how is it that we minister to the people? How is it that the people present can celebrate the presence of this awesome God? In what language? In what ways? In what gestures? What makes sense? The pastor's experience is different, um, and the liturgical scholars recognize that along the way. The liturgical books may not have, but certainly pastoral experience does. We can say, well, Latin, you know, it worked because we had our missiles, but Latin's a, pretty much a dead language. But the church is living. How to incorporate the tradition of Latin with a living church? I suggest, simply for no other reason I can't sing, use the Sanctus and the Agnus Dei, holy, holy, holy Lamb of God. It works really nicely in Latin. If I do that in English, it falls on its face. Actually, it doesn't do much better when I do it in Latin, but at least we can get through it when I do it in Latin. And some of those old Marian hymns, I really like them. And a couple of the old uh, Eucharistic hymns, Panis Angelicus and Pancha Lingua and all that, they really do work if we follow them along because the lyrics are just so sensible in Latin and they don't translate really well into English. And then we have to consider a worldwide church and the languages and cultures of the people. Certainly, the people of Africa have a rather indigenous um, liturgy for themselves. Doesn't look a whole lot like what we do in English in, in, in North America. Some of the newer churches have to make way for what's, in, what's important for them. Mass is for the children. You can't use some of these words for chew with the children. It's simply, they're, they're, they don't get it. And so it's a matter of making it accessible. The liturgy is the it. Making the liturgy accessible to the people because they're the one that's doing the work. Remember, liturgy is the work of the people. The work of the people is praising God for everything that he's done and what he continues to do. And so make it available. Respect various cultures, of course. In the wedding rite, for example, in the United States, we respect the Latin cultures that have a veil and a lasso and coins. And maybe some Anglos say that, what's this all about? It's very cultural. And to tell that couple that they can't do it because you're in Orange County, California, you're not gonna win. Do it. To tell a father that he's not gonna walk his daughter up the aisle because the new rite of marriage suggests that the couple walk up together, Forget it, you're not gonna win. Don't even try. And so respect the various cultures, respect the various rituals to bring honor and glory to this awesome God. The new mass, you might say, who approved this anyway? Well, Vatican Council II did. The first of the votes that was taken was to um, change the liturgy, reform it, as we might say, there were 2,162 in favor and 46 opposed. That's a 97 approval rate. Any president of the United States would like that, I suppose. Frankly, any pastor would like that too. And in the very end, the, the last of the votes to be taken after all of the considerations and everything were um, considered was 2,147 in favor and four against pretty good numbers. Curiously enough, one of the ones who was, we presume, against it, the vote was more or less secret, was a certain Cardinal Ottaviani. Ottaviani was the last of the cardinal protectors of the Servite order. He was extremely conservative. It was said that when he got into his taxi and 
he told the taxi driver to take him to the, to the church council. He wept when the taxi did not drive toward Trent, but rather toward um, the Vatican itself. Taviani, um, there's a story told one of our um, English friars, Father Joe Colella, was the master of ceremonies for the Servites very often in, in those years, the early 1960s. And Taviani, staunch, immovable, probably somewhat humorless, um, was our um, ordaining priest in Rome. And Joe Colella was England's answer to Groucho Marx in many ways, just a brilliant, brilliant man and extremely funny and had the Groucho Marx um, mustache. And as a um, young deacon probably, the master of ceremonies put a Taviani's helmet, I, I mean mitre, on top with the ribbons coming down his face. And he went to adjust it and Ottaviani put his hand in and said, leave it. And he says, if I leave it, your eminence, people um, might think you a fool. And he says, they already think you a fool. Leave it. Well, anyway, who was the fool? So the approval rating uh, for this document was rather high across the entire church. And we ought to honor it. And we ought to honor Vatican Council too as something that really happened and was an honorary council of the church, not something that was to be argued with many years later. The primary experience of the church is when we gather together for liturgy. So that puts an awful lot of burden on the ministers of the church, whether it be the deacon, the priest, or the other ministers of hospitality, ministers of reader, ministers of the Eucharist, to make the experience pleasant for those who ordinarily do not come or don't even know the Roman Catholic Church might be afraid to walk in the door. So my advice and direction is to do baptisms and weddings and funerals and confirmations nicely so that people feel welcomed, so that they feel invited, so that they can experience this God who is awesome, merciful, forgiving sins and promising everlasting life because we're giving them an encounter with God in Jesus, an encounter that is called the real presence. So it's like no other encounter. It's not the same as encountering Jesus in the scripture. It's encountering him in the Holy Eucharist and the breaking of the bread and the way that he's really present to us. And that's an important thing. Here he is in his real presence, this God who is love comes to us, not merely to um, be read about, not merely to be spoken about, but because he's really present in his love. Do we encounter that in the, in the liturgy, in the mass? Or do we just simply come because, as I've suggested before, a long time ago in another city, a sister, a religious woman, told us that if we didn't go to mass, we were going to wind up in hell. And long after, we just simply got in the habit of coming to Mass, and coming, in fact, to the 9 o'clock Mass. So with five different Masses, the Catholic communities are a variety of different Masses. Some churches have a whole lot more. Father Claude, who was here last week, his parish has eight Masses. The congregation doesn't know each other. Those that come regular to the 9 o'clock Mass on Sunday don't know the people or even the liturgical experience of the five o'clock on Saturday night or the five o'clock on Sunday night. And furthermore, you all wanna sit in the same place in the pew. And so you get in such a routine that it's this, this habit forming routine because if you don't do it, you're gonna to go to hell. Well, probably that nun has died and gone off to her reward or left the convent a long time ago. You've stopped believing in hell or you're so afraid of it that you keep coming ask, why am I here? What do I do when I come to Mass? How am I present to each, to the, the people around me? How am I present to other people? How am I present to receiving the Word? How am I present to receiving the Holy Eucharist? How am I present to God? These become important questions. What's around me? And how do I respond and even respect it? The liturgy went through several different translations along the way from the um, 
19, late 1960s to, to currently, and I said that that was the difference between currently, between dynamic and formal equivalence in the language. We might remember that we used to say something like, um, the Lord be with you, and you said, and also with you, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, that's a change. We used to say, we believe, now we say, I believe, that's a change. We used to say, and Jesus Christ became flesh, and now we say he is incarnate, these are changes. Sometimes that change goes to a scientific language, science of theology. Sometimes it's really kind of ruined in the prayer because prayer should be a bit more poetic and a bit more free-flowing and a bit easier to understand. What we're left with in this new translation, I suggest, is a bunch of long sentences, sometimes with very poor syntax and archaic scientific language. If you listened to the language of uh, December the 8th, the Immaculate Conception, you hear prevenient grace. Any idea what prevenient grace is? It's a theological term, means the grace that prevented her from ever sinning, Mary, the her, from ever sinning. And we could have said the spotless virgin, the never sinning. I translate some of these words for the, the children when they come to mass, just so they'll begin to understand. I think that's an important thing. Were there other questions maybe about the dynamic language and versus the, um, the formal equivalent? It, it, it really, dynamic, the formal equivalent that we, we changed to just a few years ago is really an interlinear translation of the Latin, and the dynamic was something that was a bit easier to understand. Um, the sentences were shorter. You could figure out what the verb was or is. Uh, these these are, are huge differences, in, in my opinion. Any questions about that? Notice, did you remember the way that the music had a change, too? because we changed the holy, holy, the music had it, because we changed the, the Gloria, the music had a change as well, because the language has to be the same. We're looking for unity, always unity. Any questions about dynamic versus, for, yes, let's see. Consubstantial, yeah. one in being with, yeah. One of the same being consubstantial. That's a good scientific word. You see, when we said one in being, we knew what it meant. You know, the same as. Okay. You know, there was a, an interesting change. I've got to watch what I'm saying. This is being recorded. There, there's an interesting change in, in the, um, um, the words of institution, the consecration. For the longest time, and I don't know why, I added four. For this is my body. I don't, I, 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 I evidently, I, somewhere along the way as a priest, I started saying for. There was a fellow at another church who um, was a self-proclaimed theologian who came running after me after a few times that I was there that said, Father, do you believe that the words of consecration are the very words that Jesus spoke at the Last Supper? No, I don't. I, I don't know what Jesus spoke about. None of us do. We don't know the very, the same, we don't know the exact words of the Gettysburg Address. I mean, there, there are several different copies of the Gettysburg Address with, uh, with notes and, and um, annotations in, in Abraham Lincoln's own handwriting. We're not sure of the very words of the, of the Gettysburg Address, which is a lot more recent than the Last Supper. And I, I said, I, I really don't. Um, and it, I, it, there must be a problem that you're running after me and you're, you're somewhat angry. You had the word, the preposition for, and I said, I'm sorry. So I quit doing it. In the new translation, it's there. I'm just ahead of my time, I suppose. You know, and it, it also makes, it, if you were to diagram that sentence, really think about it. You need a preposition, a preposition has to be added. I understand that it could be understood. The, prep, the presence of the preposition, you could put it in parentheses. I mean, this man was so irate. You know, I, 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 he was like Will Smith, ready to slap me. But, but um, I, 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 I just, you know, I, sometimes, you know, these, these translations, 
Thank you, yeah, consubstantial, you know. So I kind of did that. And, and also, this um, problem with pronouns, you know, the, the priest that was caught for saying we believe, well, if you understand the way a pronoun works, when we say we, we mean I. I'm included in we. We all are here tonight. I'm here tonight. We are here tonight. I understand that it's uh, uh, sometimes a command, I order you. Sometimes it's a I do this, it's not a we. But um, l l let's be maybe a little bit more forgiving and, and understanding of how language works from time to time. It's an important thing. Okay, We went on to describe the altar, um, and I, I asked really, because it's the foundational question of how we understand the Mass, is it a meal or is it a sacrifice? If it's a meal, then we're really concentrating on the Last Supper, when Jesus is preparing the meal. And we use the very word meal often in the Mass. And we have the elements of the meal, the chalice. Remember, we used to call it a cup in the old translation. Now it's a chalice because all chalices are cups, but not all cups are chalices. There's a logic to it, I suppose. And so we have the presence of a meal. We have candles. We have um, a table. Is it a, a meal? Well, maybe those candles are there because Christ is the light of the world. Maybe the altar looks like a tomb because it's an altar of sacrifice, because the Lamb of God is Jesus who is sacrificed to his heavenly Father and, in fact, slaughtered. And it, it, it's a sacrificial meal. Is the altar a table or a tomb? These are, um, you know, important ways of seeing things and, and really reflecting on what's going on and where you are. You know, see, the, the food from the, the meal is given to everybody. Oh, kind of like feeding the 5,000. See, there are a lot of symbols that um, are very important in our liturgy. Those candles. Are they the candles of a table? And so we have a very festive meal that we're celebrating. And the candles are the table candles. Are the candles the light of Christ present, showing up? Are the, the candles mark time? I like candles that, that are wax and, and burn down. Some candles are eternal candles. You just like the candles of the processional candles. That you just fill them with liquid paraffin and they never burn down. I like marking time with the candles burning down. The Easter candle, in my humble opinion, of which everyone's entitled, must be a candle that burns down to keep um, putting another candle in there so it always remains the same height or to fill it with uh, paraffin wax and never have it burn down, I believe is a huge mistake because by the end of the, the season, the candle should be burning down. If we were a more active church, by now that candle would be, a, the Easter candle would be a stump. Go to some of the more active parishes that have a lot of masses or a lot of baptisms or a lot of funerals. That's when you light the candle, baptisms and funerals. And every mass at the Easter season, the candles are, have been burned down. In some places, they had to re, re, replenish the candle. I just like when, when we have even the altar candles or the, the Easter candle, it has to burn down in my opinion. The Easter candle, it, it, it's very much the symbol of life and light and Easter and the resurrection. You have to have a brand new one every year and it's dated every year. The symbols are very important or, or else the, the liturgy doesn't work. And I encourage you to kind of really think about the, the Easter water is very important. We bless this new water at Easter. The candle is put into the new water. Those who are to be baptized at Easter are baptized with that new water. And it's the Easter water. And then I came once and the sacristans kind of put it out on the plants, the Easter water. The morning after Easter, holy cannoli. I, you know, you just can't do that. Not with the Easter water. Um, other things, the procession, again, 
becomes, uh, there's an important symbol when the candidates are let out of the church with the gospel. It's, you're holding the, and you're being led by the gospel of Jesus out the door. That's an important symbol to just sort of walk out, you know, well, okay, and so you didn't get to stay for the whole show, huh? You're not one of us yet. I, no, you have to be let out by the, did you notice the symbols yesterday in, in the prodigal son? The dad, when the kid came back, the dad put shoes on his feet, gave him a ring and a robe to wear. The, those are important symbols. The kid wanted to be treated as a slave. You don't put shoes on a slave, he'll run away. You keep the slave without shoes. The ring on the finger, it shows a relationship. You're wearing wedding bands, many of you. That shows a relationship that's extremely important. And so the dad gave, gave a, a, a ring. I swindled another priest out of this ring. Um, it, and I remember it too, and, and I, I'm happy to to remind that Prony is dead now. Um, I, that, that's, a, that's a relationship ring I swindled out of. Um, the, the, a ring on his finger, that, that shows a relationship. The robe, that's kind of like royalty. Um, you can almost imagine a purple robe, which was the royal robe. They're important symbols that we, we have to be very, very much aware of. Otherwise, you're destroying church. You know, the religious habits of, 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 clear, of, of the religious clergy my religious habit, Father Claude last week was in white, and so we had, remember, white and black, you saw. I mean, those are important symbols of, of consecration to religious life. And, you know, you look around and, and the, the, the symbols become important. The symbols of the, the uh, incense, the prayers, our last prayers rising to God. There's also practical reasons for the incense. The church smelt because people were dirty. They, they didn't shower every day. They brought all sorts of stuff in, and it just fragranced the church. There's a practical, there's a practical reason for the uh, candles light. There's a, there are practical reasons, too, but let's not consider the practical reason. That makes it into a, into a sign. It points away from itself to something else or just shows that it's useful. But the, the symbols, to, to, and then to not use the symbols, you know, we, um, we sprinkle the casket with water to recall the baptism. We use the water. We use the, the incense. Prayers right. Use the incense. Don't be afraid of it. We, we, we need to, I, I was taught grand gestures when I was in priest school with the T pronounced clearly. And so I continue to use grand gestures. I, I, if you're going to use water, use water. And so on Easter Sunday, just prepare to be splashed. And, and somebody might say, you owe me for a dry cleaning bill. No, I owe you for a wet cleaning bill. I mean, you're, you're, you're soaking wet. Uh, you know, use the symbols. Don't, not sparingly, but, but gloriously. And not to entertain, but to celebrate. You know, this is, your part this is our participation in the new life of Easter. Celebrate it. The... Um, Easter, Holy Saturday night, when we hear the A word, alleluia, um, you know, after not hearing it for all of Lent, process the gospel around the church with, with holy smoke and air. You just use the, the, the symbols. Use them wisely and, and use them bravely and use them proudly, of course. But, I mean, just think of how often symbols are missed. I suppose some of us did miss the symbols in the, in the prodigal son. The, that little story is filled with symbols. And then, how does the liturgy bring life to faith and faith to life? Consider that. How does the liturgy bring faith to life and life to faith? Because it tells us about God, because it tells us to go off and proclaim the good news by the way we live our lives. Do you hear that at the end? Our celebration is ended. Let us go and glorify the Lord by the way we live our lives. That's an important command. It's an important way to be sent. We give thanksgiving, which is what the word Eucharist means. We've gathered to give thanksgiving so that we can go out and be thanksgiving. Kind of like today's reading that 
you know, I give thanks to God for this life. And, and I suggested, what if the question at the end of life, when you get to the gates, is, is not going to be, can you spell Albuquerque? I, I'm guaranteed of that. But maybe, did you enjoy the life I gave you? Oh, no, it was treachery. It was just hell. Oh, fine, then you won't mind this. You know, bingo, trap door goes in, you go to hell, you see. Um, but, but go out and celebrate the life, the new life that you have, the new life in Jesus, the life of the resurrection, the life of the forgiveness of sins, the life of the merciful God, the life of unity and peace, the life of the God incarnate, the life of the one who's consubstantial with the Father, you know, and, and, and bring that faith to life because that's what we're doing here. And that's what you're doing by way of celebrating. You're certainly not being entertained. Remember, there was a huge difference between being entertained and, and celebrating. If you go to the show to be entertained, you're, act, you're being acted upon. Somebody is you know, playing with you in, in, in a humorous kind of venue, and you're watching. But here, you're, we are celebrating. We're acting out in our own way who God is for us and all of us gathered together. So it's the importance of listening always so that we receive the message. We participate as we celebrate the presence of the Lord with us. And we also respond. We respond after we hear the word because the gospel unnerves us. And if the gospel doesn't unnerve us, we've not heard, how could that dad ever take that kid back? That lousy kid, I mean, he left home. I mean, he, he deserves everything that came to him. You know, he's, I, I wouldn't have him back in my house. He took him in with a ring on his finger to show the relationship, shoes on his feet, he's no slave, and a robe. He's a royal person. I agree with the older kid. That guy like around. Sorry, if you're unnerved, then you've heard the gospel. And hopefully, there was some unnerving with the, the homily as well. Again, don't run up and, and slap the homilist, um, but, but rather sort of think about what the homilist is telling you to do so that you can be changed. Because that's why we gather too, to be changed, to be converted to have new intellectual insights of who God is. Maybe we're hearing that prayer for the first time. We're hearing that theology, that study of God for the first time. Maybe we're feeling it for the first time. I've got that joy, 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 joy down in my heart, down in my heart, you know, and feel the joy. It's all right to feel joyful in church. You don't have to feel unhappy. You don't have to feel sad and uh, you know, sorrowful. Feel the joy. And then go out with your arms and legs and mouth and ears and eyes and, 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 and be that joy. You know, a moral conversion. Intellectual, affective, and moral. That's why we've gathered. That's what puts faith to life and life to faith. These are the experiences of the, the liturgy. The experience that we have of Jesus Christ the experience that we have of the revelation of Jesus new to us today. The experience of Jesus is our faith. What does faith mean? Faith is an experience of God as he's revealed, he, God, is revealed in Jesus Christ. And we have that in the liturgy, an experience, an experience that brings joy, an experience that brings conversion, an experience that was work because liturgy is the work of the people. It's the work of our celebration. It's that ritual, those repeated actions. Aren't repeated actions boring? Well, not really. Do you find birthdays boring? You know, and we do the same thing. Do you find Christmas boring? Do you find Thanksgiving boring? Do you find the 4th of July boring? We do the same thing, all of those um, uh, events in our lives, all of those days of celebration in our lives, we, we do it again and again, ritual, repeated actions, the same time. I mean, if it was different all the time, holy cow, I, what's happening now? Sometimes I go to funerals of, of other um, Christian congregations, and I wish there was a ritual. 
now we're going to sing a song. Now we're going to hear some reflection. We're going to read some scripture. Now we're going to sing another song. Now we're going to hear something about the, the life of Michael. Now we're going to hear a homily about the reading that we heard. Now we're going to hear a eulogy about the life. Now we're going to sing another song. Now we're going to explain why, all we're, why we're all wearing Hawaiian shirts. You know, there's no ritual. And now I'm going to ask, how long is this going to last? When am I going to know that it's over? Um, the, the, the ritual, these repeated actions, give us purpose, really. They hold us together in this unity and peace. They tell us what the work is that we're celebrating. And the liturgy works because the assembly does the work. In the assembly, all the barriers should be diminished. The barriers of race, the barriers of socioeconomic class, the barriers of education and ideology, all of that um, empties out because there's one thing that we're doing, giving praise to God for what he's done and what he continues to do. In our liturgy, the poor sit with the rich, the ignorant sit with the, um, the learned, um, the nameless sit with celebrities, the outcast, outcast sit with the respectable class. We all come together in the same church um, w without price, without fee, and we give up all of that just to be present to God. That was a, a bit about all of the theology of the liturgy, and I want to do some of the mechanics of it. Are there any questions at this point? Anyone? Yes, Matthew. The, this is an excellent question. The Holy Eucharist is not a symbol. It's the real presence. As Flannery O'Connor famously said, if it's just a symbol, to hell with it. Um, it. It's the real presence. Do not call the consecrated host a symbol. It is not a symbol of Jesus Christ. It is Jesus Christ. And for that reason, we keep the, the remainder um, for, for use. For that reason, we be sure that it's consumed, uh, that, that it's eaten. You know, oftentimes, well, not oftentimes anymore, every time now, at funerals and weddings, when um, there are non-Catholics present, I think it's very wise for a priest, I always make the announcement, if you're part of our Catholic faith and you receive Holy Eucharist, please come forward and receive the Eucharist. If you've never received Holy Eucharist, but would appreciate a Christian blessing, we'll give you a blessing when you come forward to try and say, unless you're initiated and, and recognize the real presence, please do not take the Holy Eucharist and put it in your pocket. For that reason, I, I, I make the announcement. I, I don't know what some people do with it. And we here at St. Julianus, I, I'm very fortunate and very grateful that um, I've often been asked, why are those ushers acting like guards at the ends of the pews? To be sure that the Holy Eucharist is consumed. We have to. I mean, there was the day when, you know, very few Catholics came to Holy Eucharist, let alone everybody else. And, and today it's, it's kind of everybody comes. And we try and make the um, announcement. There's a priest I know and, and respect very much that makes a very similar announcement. And he says, if you have no idea of what I've just said, please sit down. <laughs> I think that's funny. I mean, and so that's the command, you know. If you choose to not come forward at all in the procession for either the Holy Eucharist or a blessing, please take your seat. You know, and, and this other priest says that. He says it in a very nice way. And we've come celebrated weddings and funerals. Um, we know a lot of the same people. And, and that's what he says. If what I've just told you makes no sense, please sit down. So do not say that the Eucharist is a symbol. It is not a symbol. It is beyond symbol. It's the real presence of Jesus. Okay? 
I'd like to, any other questions? Okay, I'd like to just go through a little bit of the mechanics um, of, of the mass, and I have some time left to do that. So I've spoken, I'm gonna go up here to the um, altar. Should I explain this? Some have asked uh, about the monstrance and exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. This is called a monstrance. It has nothing to do with scary images like monsters. It has everything to do with putting on display as in demonstrate. And so Jesus in a consecrated host goes in, in this middle part and we put it on the altar. And we don't really call it um, adoration of the Blessed Sacrament at this point. This is called exposition. Jesus is exposed in the Blessed Sacrament on the altar. Here at St. Juliana, we do it on the first Tuesday of the month, currently from after the 6.30 a.m. mass until eight o'clock p.m. Some churches are doing it around the clock. We'd like, like to get us back to around the clock, but we're not there yet. And so uh, people, have, uh, some have asked if I would explain this, the monstrance, okay? And we, some of them, the new one at, the, at Christ Cathedral, when they have the, the holder on the bottom, there's a base sometimes. It's just absolutely beautiful. It, it, these are things that you should say, wow. Go, go to um, um, Mission San Juan Capistrano to, to the new basilica for in the evening of um, exposition and the lights, if they still have it the same way, lights are shade. It's just, it's a wow experience. When I was a child, and some of you were children at about the same time I was, at exposition of the Blessed Sacrament, the church was an undiscovered tomb, absolutely quiet. Sisters had us convinced that if we were to sneeze, belch, fart, anything, I mean, all hell was gonna to come to us individually. We were gonna be dusted, nuked. That was it. I mean, it was the one time for almost an hour that, that, that it was absolute reverence. This was it. Jesus and the Blessed Sacrament. And, the, and it still is for me. I, some groups, um, younger people, have continual um, noise during it. There's singing and talks and reading of scripture and praying of the rosary and other things. I, I, I'm just not there. You know, if it works for the kids, I guess do it. But see, that all harkens to me, for me, back to McDonald's, who ruined the family meal. When they put up that playground in a restaurant, they forever ruined the family meal. I wasn't allowed to leave the table until grandpa said that's all, when grandpa was at table, when, when we had a formal dinner. Once grandpa said that's all, then we could take off. But until grandpa said that's all, that was, it. you were at the table. See, but McDonald's came along with, you know, the, the playground and, and that ruined the family meal, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I, I, I much prefer the um, exposition of the Blessed Sacrament. The church should be an undiscovered tomb. Argue among yourselves, I don't care, but that's my, um, my point. I, I was crushed. I, I had my hour at, at San Juan Capistrano for the years that I was there. And then another group came along and had songs and um, readings and all sorts of stuff. And I thought, this is bad. Then I realized there were 24 hours of exposition. I could choose another one. So um, I did. With anger. No. Um, <laughs> anyway. Um, that's, uh, you, uh, people were asked about the monstrance. I'm gonna go behind the altar. So we have the opening um, procession, remember, and it, it's clearly just to, to get the, the celebrating clergy from, or the celebrating ministers from the back of the church to the front of the church. And it should be a song that is thematic with the readings and also the season of the year. Don't sing away in a manger on Easter Sunday. Don't sing, I will raise him up on um, Christmas morning. You know, sing appropriate. Do not sing, um, you know, gone for good or um, hey, 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 goodbye at the funeral. Um, you know, just a, a, an appropriate song. An appropriate song at funeral is always a resurrection. 
an appropriate homily at a funeral is always about the resurrection. An appropriate time to talk about Michael at the funeral is the words of remembrance. If you go to a Catholic funeral and don't hear about the resurrection, I, I don't know what you're doing. Um, you, you should hear, and it should be resurrection readings, it should be resurrection songs, it should be resurrection reflection. Um, it's, that's what it's about, the resurrection. And so we get to the front. And then the priest kisses the altar because there's an altar stone. This altar evidently used to be back there because the altar stone is here. So when the old mass um, priest would, would gather with, with his back to the people, he would kiss the altar stone. The altar stone has a relic. Usually it's a relic of a martyr or a relic of the patron or patroness of the church. I don't know what's in that altar stone. We kiss the altar for the altar stone's sake. And then we go to our chair, the presidential chair, which should be different from all other chairs and should be nicely lighted too, by the way. The altar should be nicely lighted. The ambo, altar, presidential chairs should all have nice lights on them and um, go from the chair to the opening, which is the simple greeting in the, uh, the language of the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Lord be with you. A simple little um, call to mind our sins. Do not incur guilt among the people because we have more food than every other person, you know, and we don't share it, and we're selfish little narcissistic wretches that we are, Lord have mercy. No, don't do that. You see, Lord have mercy is plenty good. Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. We've called to mind our sins. Have mercy on us. And then we're told that God is merciful, forgives sins, and brings us everlasting life. And then the Gloria, and then the opening prayer, and then sit down. And the opening prayer prepares us for what's going to happen. It tells us to keep our mind and heart and spirit alive to listen to the readings and to know your will for us in our lives. That's what the opening prayer speaks about. And then the readings from the Ambo. And um, it's best, I, I insist, to listen to the readings from the Ambo. If, you're, if you speak the same language as, as the, the reader and the readings. And then um, a reflection, because you've received the word, both the readings of the Old Testament or New Testament, the responsorial psalm, and the gospel. Before the gospel, there's the wonderful uplifting, this season of the year, um, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ, King of endless glory. And at the other times of the year, alleluia. And if the alleluia is not sung, it should not be spoken because you really don't spoke it. You really don't speak alleluia. It doesn't have the same thing as, as the song does. Um, you, you have to sing alleluia. And then a reflection. And I hint to you with that window of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you should not be hearing bad homilies at St. Juliana because the Holy Spirit is guiding whoever is in that booth and, and that box uh, to, to give a good homily. And, and to, to, you should hear good homilies. Um, and and I, I hope at St. Julian, as you do, all the time, 97% of the time, um, you do. The Holy Spirit's there to, to guide the homilist. And then we go to the prayer of the faithful, or the universal prayer, as it's called, where we pray for, there's always a, an order, usually an order. The order goes, we pray for Holy Church, nations of the world, and ourselves. And for Holy Church, that the Spirit continues to guide her, and for nations of the world, that the leaders respect the dignity of all human life, and for ourselves, for the stuff that we need, rain, for the stuff that we need, health, for the stuff that we need, whatever it might be, um, this day or, or any day, vocations, and so forth. And then we close the universal prayer. And then the gifts are brought forward. When we didn't bring the gifts forward during pandemic, I, we lost a symbol for a while. It was because of the pandemic, but it, the gifts come from the people. It's the gift that's gonna be placed on the altar. Pray that my sacrifice and yours, your sacrifice is the money. Your sacrifice is treasury. And then we bring the water and wine that are going to be, excuse me, we bring the wine 
and the hosts that are going to be consecrated into the body and blood of Jesus. And we bring those um, as well. So the gifts, which always represent the people, always represent the people, you're being represented. And so when we didn't do that for a while, there was, um, you know, a, a, a symbol was lost for a while. And then we get to um, offering called the offertory, when the priest offers the bread and the priest offers the wine, and then he washes his hands. Why does the priest wash his hands? Frankly, because they got dirty from collecting the offertory. They got dirty because at one time, all sorts of stuff was brought forward and his hands got dirty. We do not wash our hands in imitation of Pontius Pilate. What nonsense. I wash my hands with this man. No, we wash our hands. Listen to, if you want to know what, what he's, listen to his prayer. And it says, we always say the black, but we read the red. The red is the rubric, ruby red, colored ink. Then the priest standing at the side of the altar washes his hands saying quietly, Wash me, O Lord, from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Make me available to you. Make me worthy. Make me acceptable to you so that I may offer this sacrifice. And we wash our hands. And again, it's a time to use water, not just, you know, drops of it. But, but use water. You're washing your hands. Okay? The same way, um, I, I skipped a part, I apologize. What does the priest or deacon do when he, he puts the water into the wine? Well, at one time that wine was very fortified. It was very strong and, and you got more of it if, if you added water to it. Um, that's a practical reason, but listen to the prayer. The deacon or priest pours wine and a little water into the chalice saying quietly, by the mystery of this water and wine, May we come to share in the divinity of Christ who humbled himself to share in our humanity. We're mixing perhaps the two natures, uh, the, the two um, qualities of, of Jesus together, the water and the wine, so that we can um, share him, him, so that we can share his blood with all of us. And that's the reason that we mix the water with the wine. That's the reason that we wash our hands. And then we go on to um, the preface of the Eucharistic prayer. The preface is always a short prayer that tells us that it tells everybody what we're doing is right and just because it brings us salvation. Use the, the simplest of all of them, the preface of the second Eucharistic prayer, which is also the oldest, perhaps. It's the prayer from Hippolytus or Hippolytus, depending on what side of the river you grew up on. Uh, and it's lasted. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks. So we're returning the thanks. We're preparing ourselves to remember the um, events of the passion and death of Jesus and his resurrection. And then we sing um, with the choirs of angels. Remember, some of the um, prefaces end with with angels and archangels and thrones and dominions and hosts and principalities. All of those are the choirs of angels. Nine choirs of angels, look them up. The nine choirs of angels, that's, what we're, um, that's who we're singing to along with every saint. And we say, holy, holy, holy. And then we go on to the Eucharistic prayer itself. We um, ask Almighty God to bless um, these gifts, to approve these gifts, to accept these gifts, and then we imitate what we believe we heard at the Last Supper. This was handed on, remember, from St. Paul, if you read 1 Corinthians, um, 12, the 12th chapter, that Paul says, I am handing on to you what I myself received, that on the night before he died, the Lord Jesus took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given for you. At that moment, we don't have bread anymore. We have the body of Christ. And Eucharistic ministers do not distribute bread. They distribute the body of Christ. 
to all who come forward and say, yes, I believe. And then in a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, once more gave thanks, gave the chalice to his disciples saying, take this all of you and drink from it. This is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many. Why? For the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The wine is no longer wine. It's the blood of Christ. It is changed forever in substance, not by accidents, to use the, the categories of the philosopher Aristotle, substance and accidents. We all have the substance of humanity. I have the accidents that look like Michael Pontarelli. You have the, the accidents that look like whatever your names are. And that's what we tell people apart. And so the accidents um, of bread remain the same. The substance changes. It doesn't usually happen that way. We don't usually change our um, uh, substance. We change our accidents. Just look at pictures when you were younger and pictures that you're older. You'll find out there have been a lot of changes. And most of them are accidental, too. If I knew that eating all that pasta would make me fat, I wouldn't have done it. It's an accidental change. Then we get to the mystery of faith. This is an important part. What is the mystery of our faith? We proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. That's indeed a mystery of faith. Jesus rising from the dead is a mystery of faith. We experience it only in faith, remember. I always have, that's the window that looks like the, um, the rooster from the Kellogg's cornflakes box. But it, it really, it, that kid must be right. It, it, it must be the, um, the Easter scene, the resurrection. So the mystery of faith, remember the old one, it was a whole lot easier. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. I loved it. I, I, I remember that one. This one I have to look at almost every time, even though I, I say it every day. I liked the old one. It is indeed a mystery. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. Why am I a Catholic Christian? Because Christ died, Christ rose, Christ will come again. That's what I believe. And that's what I celebrate. And that's what keeps me celebrating Mass every day, sometimes several times a day. There are others, too. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come in glory. That's a good mystery of faith. We eat this bread and drink this cup and we proclaim the death of the Lord until he comes in glory. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you've set us free. They're all good. I like the first one the best, and I say it almost every day. Hardly ever change it. And sometimes I even say the old one, and people wonder what I'm doing. And after that, there are several petitions. Petitions of thanksgiving, petitions for the church, Remember, Lord, your church spread throughout the world and bring her to the fullness of charity. Who, led by Pope Francis, who, led by the bishop of the diocese and all the clergy, we must pray for the unity and peace of our church, led by our pope, led by our bishop. Whether we like these people or not, they're our leaders. It's like the president. Whether we like him or not, he's our president, and we pray for him. Whether we like it or not, I am your pastor, pray for me. Whether we like it, our liking and not liking doesn't matter. In unity and peace, all of that has to fall apart, fall down, so that we have unity and peace. And then we might remember um, for on a funeral, in a very special way, the one who has died. But we also remember everyone who has died. Please, please, please. This idea that there are poor souls in purgatory for, that no one prays for them. I may have missed the class, but I don't think it's the case. For we pray for all the dead in every mass, all of them, in purgatory, hell, heaven. We pray for all of them at every mass. Um, and and they, 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 that they come into the light of, of the face of God. Then we pray for the Blessed Virgin Mary, the apostles, the martyrs, the saint of the church. I add Saint Peregrine um, for a special devotion. If 
no other reason. And also the saint of the day. I could pray for my patron saint every day, but people would get angry with that. Um, and, and then that we all merit to be co-heirs to eternal life. And then the great amen, which is really wonderful when it's sung. Um, it kind of falls apart when it's not sung, but we know that it, it's there. And it means absolutely, truly, yes, indeed, this is what I believe. Any questions to there? We have the liturgy that gathers us together to the, um, the universal prayer, the, the petitions. That's the liturgy of the word. Once we gather the gifts, that's the, litur the, the offertory, that's the liturgy of the Eucharist because we move to the table. Some of the, the liturgy begins in the, the chair and the ambo, the liturgy of the word. And then there's the liturgy of the table. Michael? Uh, Trent, actually, yeah, w w when did the Mass become kind of official in a book like this? Trent, actually, a little bit before Trent. Um, th there were just various prayers spoken. It was all kind of the same, and Eucharistic Prayer too is the older of them. Um, the friars, of which Servites are friars, once the, 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 the priests began roaming around from place to place, friars, Dominicans, Franciscans, Augustinians, Carmelites are the five groups of friars, the mendicant friars, beggars, the five, the five great groups. Um, once the, they began moving around from place to place, and sometimes they were lacking in education, various prayers that were spoken became um, heretical. Um, and, and to, to stop that, uh, especially with the Council of Trent, the first uh, Roman missiles uh, and the printing press um, helped matters a lot. Uh, there were monks who were copying things, but they didn't always copy them correctly. And there, there are a lot of, of manuscripts that, that differ one from the other. Monk, one monk couldn't, or one, one calligrapher couldn't read the previous calligrapher and, and, and took a guess at what the word was and changed it, kind of like maybe some people did at um, Ellis Island coming into this country from foreign countries. Names were changed. And, and so the, um, the, the friars and, and, and clergy maybe not, weren't as educated as they, they could have been, um, and they spoke heresies. And to create one orthodox liturgy the printing press is important, the Council of Trent is important, seminary education is important. It all becomes codified at, at that time. And that's, that's important because the language was Latin. No matter where you went, you would recognize the mass. Uh, and it, it, it just, it was, it was a good thing, but it got old after a while and, and needed some reforming and Vatican II reformed it. And there are various you know, peoples who are happy with the reform, not happy with the reform, should reform the reform, should go back to the, the Latin and all that. It's just, um, we're lacking the unity and I, I find that to be a bit problematic for my own self. I, I liked unity in the mass. I, usually that's strange for an Italian. Italians like a lot of diversity, let's face it. I, it, when it comes to something like the Mass, unity is better than um, everybody doing his own thing. And, and I find a lot of everybody doing his own thing in the Mass still. If you think it's, it's bad now, remember, I went through the seminary in the, the 1970s, and, and it was a whole lot of, let's experiment with this, because maybe it's going to change. Let's do it this way, because maybe it's going to change. Let's do it this way, because it makes a lot more sense. All of that was true. Maybe it was going to change. It didn't. It makes more sense to the group that you're celebrating Mass for. But believe me, some of the Masses we celebrated in Berkeley, California, were not for the people of, of Fullerton, California. In fact, they weren't even for the people of, you know, San Leonardo. Uh, yes? 
Mitzi. Oh, please. No, I'm not in favor of bells. There's no reason for them. You see, the bells worked when um, the priest had his back to the people and was speaking Latin. Now we're facing you, and you see what's going on. When the priest had his back to the, back to the people and was speaking Latin, people were celebrating private devotions. They were praying rosaries. They were saying devotions to all sorts of saints and, and um, they were praying other prayers. Now you, you pray the prayer of the mass that's, that's, that's being celebrated in front of you. In my opinion, there's no reason for bells. I, I hear them, they're coming back all over the place as putting the, the, the tabernacle in the center of the church is coming back. Many churches that were built um, with Eucharistic chapels are now replacing the tabernacle. And the St. Juliana, the tabernacle never moved. I, I explained that I had ideas of moving the tabernacle into the um, children's chapel. But thanks to you know, some groups in our church, the pastoral council at one, that chairman of the past, pastoral council too, advised strongly against it. I, I, I thought we could have a Eucharistic chapel and maybe a, a, a bigger confessional kind of thing. But I, I was told, you don't look through the window and see what's going on in there and, and the necessity for it. And there was a necessity for it. Um, I looked in there one day and, and kids were making forts with the um, missiles and doing all kinds of things. But anyway, um, I, I don't find a, a reason for the bells personally, and I find them distracting when they are rung. They were good at one time. They've served their purpose. You like the bells? Yeah. I know. Several do. I, I've been asked. You, you're, you're not the first one to ask about the bells in St. Juliana. I know where they are. <laughs> they're, they're not going to be used anytime soon if I have my way. Yeah. You know, what, what could change everything um, is the cathedral liturgy. It was, um, it was at one point the cathedral itself set the tone, because it's the bishop's church, set the tone for the liturgy throughout the diocese. We've lost that unity as well. In one way, thank God, because I don't like some of the things that he does over there. But I like the bishop very much. And, and thank God he likes me so far. And, and that can change in the morning. I don't want it to. But, but um, I, regarding bells, I don't, I don't want them. I mean, I don't mind the smoke, incense. I really like it. We just don't, I don't do it too often here. At, at, um, when I was at, at Holy Family Cathedral uh, for, you know, rent a priest, and at uh, San Juan Capistrano, we used smoke a lot, the incense a lot. And, and I, I like that. You know, generally, I like playing with toys. I'm a child. I'm a child. Okay. I also like, you know, the 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 um, the, the the bells in the bell tower. At at San Juan Capistrano, they have ringing bells. At at um, Saint Boniface, they have ringing bells. At Holy Family Cathedral, they have recorded bells. And and so, um, when I was at Holy Family Cathedral as rent a priest. I, I would go there during the summers. I, I went there on Sundays and also during the summers and Easter vacation. For funeral, one of the first funerals, or several funerals, I rang the toller, and it bong, 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 at the end of the funeral. And um, Mons, my good friend, Monsignor Hoffman says, you're doing it. I've waited to see who was the one that was doing it. He calls me Ponto. Ponto, you're doing it. I said, doing what, Art? And he says, ringing the toller. Aren't you supposed to at the end of a funeral? No, the neighbors get really upset. Well, you know, so I stopped. And then when at, Holy, at um, the, uh, the Basilica, where they have the real bells, he, Monsignor Hopin got a remote control for them. And there were strict instructions. Don't let Ponto know where this is. Well, Ponto found it. And, and the bells went off <laughs> with some regularity. And, um, yeah, th those bells, I, I wish we could have a bell tower. The, the, the cities have ordinances against them now in neighborhoods. Yes, James. Go back to comments. Um, Mike was talking about past 32 years and now how does the liturgy work? The beginning of our liturgy really started as a house church with the pew. The liturgy itself was a liturgical word. What happened after that is what has became called. Now we have the beginning of the liturgy, and from there, what we call 
Right. Did, did, you understood all of that, right? That, that our, our liturgy is an outbreak of the Passover meal. And remember, the, the Easter, the date for Easter is set for, by the, um, the, the moon. Easter is the first Sunday after the first full moon after the vernal equinox. It's similar to when Passover is. And so it's an outgrowth of, of the Passover meal. It's also the command of Jesus in um, Corinthians to do this in memory of me. And it just kind of grew up in houses. Eventually, the need for a church comes along. There are two things that come along. One, the, the need for a codified liturgy and the need for a church itself so that um, we are, we're celebrating as a community in a place that's big enough to accept the community. And it looks like a church. I mean, you, you can have, I mean, people tell me, well, we could have mass wherever we want. Yeah, that's right, you can. You can also sleep wherever you want to. And I suppose after a while of sleeping in the kitchen, you're gonna to want to go to a bedroom. You know, you, you can dine wherever you want to. And you, know, you can only have so many meals in bed before you wanna to go to a dining room. I mean, that's why we have these rooms that have these special names. And we have this place that has a special name called a church. Okay? So I got back to the, um, we're gonna run out of time in a moment. I didn't think we would. So we, we got to the great amen. After the great amen, we pray the prayer that, that Jesus taught us, the Our Father. And then we pray that the Lord deliver us from all evil, um, grant peace in our days, keep us free from sin, and we're gonna wait until the coming of our Savior. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. The prayer for unity, um, first of all, that we pray God not look at our sins, but rather on the unity and peace of the church. And then peace be with everybody. Some liturgists argue that that is in the wrong place. It ought to be maybe after the uh, penitential act. Whether it's at the penitential act or not, it's here, and this is where it's going to be. And we should look at each other and, and greet each other with peace. And then there's that strange thing. The host, the priest host is broken, and any hosts that are, are brought for, con for, for consecration are put into a variety of saboria if they're not already. And that's called the fraction rite. We break the priest host, we distribute the others, we fraction them. And that strange little business where the priest takes a piece of his host and drops it in the wine. There's a historical reason. Um, the Pope would, would break off part of, of his host and other people would then bring it around to the stational churches of Rome. That's the consecrated Pope's host. It became then the cathedral host, since the Pope would, is the Bishop of Rome, the bishop, the ordinary bishop would bring it to stational, or the um, various ministers would bring the, the bishop's ho part of the bishop's host to station, stational churches. Or you can listen to the prayer. May this mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. Ah, the mingling of the body and blood of Christ. It makes a whole lot more sense. For whatever historical reason is missing today, the, um, the theological reason is there today. And then we celebrate the song Lamb of God. Remember, Lamb of God has a couple of meanings. One, it's just a term of endearment. You might be called the Lamb of God, like we call each other, uh, you know, peaches and cream and honey and sugar pie and all that. Lamb of God works. Also, the Lamb of God is the Lamb of Sacrifice, the Lamb who takes away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us, grant us peace. And then the distribution of the body and blood of Christ. Not the bread and the wine, the body and blood of Christ. Very important, okay? And then the st storing of the um, body of Christ, the consuming of the excess blood of Christ, and then the closing prayer, which is a prayer of thanksgiving. We give thanks to God for all of, all of this that we've done together, this celebration in his name. We pray that we're converted to be better than we were when we came in these doors to go out and proclaim the glory and, and praise of God forever. 
Somewhere along the way, you give the announcements. The liturgical theologians argue. Should they be done before the prayer after communion, or should they be done after the prayer after communion? This one likes before the prayer after communion. You're all seated anyway. Otherwise, you jump up, and then you sit down again. Let's do it one way and not two. Okay? And then the exit, the recessional song. Again, simply to move the ministers from the sanctuary to the doors of the church to greet the people who are leaving. Okay, remember, here's the church, here's the steeple, open the doors and see all the people. Now they have to leave, and, and they go out. Okay? And that should be a, a joyful song as well. Okay? It, 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 it should not be, you know, take me out to the ball game, um, or I did it my way, or New York, New York. Whatever, you know, St. Francis Albert Sinatra ever sang, it, it probably doesn't belong in the liturgy. But, but something of, go on and make a difference. I love that song. You know, something that, 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 that speaks of conversion and making a difference, something that's uplifting. You might want to have a song that people can whistle, you know, kind of like Rodgers and Hammerstein. Okay? And then maybe some kind of postlude on, an, on the uh, organ or piano. James? You're getting all of Christ, body, soul, divinity, all of it, humanity, in the body of Christ, in the, um, the Eucharistic bread. It's a fuller symbol with the, um, the body and the blood, but it's a complete um, expression in the, um, the, the, the body alone. It's complete. Remember being told not to chew the wafer? Yeah. Wasn't that silly? Yeah, don't chew the wafer. You, you'll, you'll hear your bones, bones crushing and you'll, you'll, you'll taste blood. Yeah. You know, the sisters at St. Catherine's weren't like that to us. Thank God. And our, I don't think our, certainly my mother and my good friend's mother w wouldn't allow it. They would stop that immediately. Just immediately they would stop that. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, Matthew. The same way that, that I answered it for Michael. We codified it in the book, the hierarchy did, at the Council of Trent in the 1500s. Yeah, the hierarchy does these things for us. Remember, we're not a democracy. We're a hierarchy. And, and at the Council of Trent, which has, the council has authority beyond um, instruction, beyond a bishop. The council is a high authority. And so the Council of Trent, the, the authority there, created what we used to call the Tridentine Mass, Tridentine um, being the um, adjectival form of Trent. Uh, David? Huh. Vatican II, is it uh, completely implemented? It's going to be difficult to answer with, without some criticism somewhere along the way. Um, no. And, and so Pope um, St. Uh, John Paul II and Benedict have allowed for um, the, the Latin or a traditional mass which to some really says that Vatican II is not going to be implemented because the, the mentality is not going to go away. The mentality of Vatican II is simply not, the mentality of pre-Vatican II is simply not being taught any longer. 
one would think eventually we're going to have a pope who did not experience Latin, and then things will change. The, the language, the, the theological language, the philosophical categories of Aristotle, it just simply aren't being taught. They're being taught, but they're, they're not lived any longer. Um, and uh, some of all of that, it, it, it really doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And it's causing disunity rather than unity. When I was last week speaking with Father Claude, I, I, I'm more for bringing unity than disunity. And the various expressions, especially with receiving communion, is calling more attention to people than to the unity of the church. And, and that's, you know, what we put up with it. Um, I, I, I dare say there's a, a difference between tolerating and accepting. You know, we tolerate that. I don't know that we accept it. Um, so no, Vatican II in, in the liturgy has not been um, fully accepted and implemented. What was the second question? Oh, the site altars and all that. Site altars and all of that, um, they're needed and they're not. Uh, there was kind of an understanding that a priest would say mass every day. Um, that was never really the case. Priests do have days off and they don't celebrate mass. Um, priests uh, maybe just don't celebrate mass. They, they, they participate by sitting in a congregation sometimes. And so and when they had monasteries that had a bunch of priests, all of the site altars were functional with the priest celebrating a private mass. A private mass today is allowed in the Roman Missal, but um, it's somewhat of an anomaly. It's much better to have a congregation and, and people to pray with, people to consecrate the, the Eucharist for. Uh, it, it's, you know, it's like having a meal all by yourself. It's nice, I mean, I do it a lot but I, I enjoy people too, well sometimes, at a distance and for a while. No, I, you know, you, you enjoy eating with others. You see, I mean, you know, we, we, we as human beings like, like eating with other people. In, in German, I don't know anything about German. Well, I do know a little bit about German. Um, there, there are two words for eating, and, and one of them has to do with eating as, as a group of people together, and the other has to be just eating to consume food like the dog does. You know, the dogs usually don't like other dogs around their dog bowl. Um, but, but, and we humans kind of like having people around our dining room table, especially if they're invited. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> you see? So uh, Vatican II in, in the liturgy, uh, it, it started and it stalled, and um, through various um, directives, of Pope St. John Paul II and now Benedict and, and now Francis it, it got involved and let's, let's, let's do what Vatican II asks us to do. I mean, it's, it's almost 60 years old. You know, if we haven't done it in 60 years, I mean, what, what's, this, what's the holdup now? You wouldn't have thought of that in, in Trent. But now we, you know, it, it's, it's kind of like, you know, we, we like authority, but we don't like this authority. So we're going to resist this authority. It's not fair. Okay. We're at the end of our time. Are there any more questions? Anything else I can explain or help you with? Um, fine. I don't understand. Yeah. Trent was a council of the church in the 1560s that codified a lot of what we Catholics believe because uh, there was kind of maybe misunderstood or being threatened by the formation of the Protestant churches just before it. So it was a, we call the, the, the Protestant time the, Reform, the Reformation. Um, they reformed Roman Catholicism, and then the Roman Catholics had a counter-reformation to, to, um, to group us back together again. And so they codified what it is that we believe and in the Council of Trent, if you, it was written, this is what the Roman Catholic Church believes. If you don't believe this anathema, go to hell. Literally, you know. 
and, and so Trent. And the Trent, the mass of Trent, the Tridentine mass, was celebrated from the 1560s, roughly. Um, forgive me if I'm a couple of years off, to the, the 1969 or 68, the, the mass changed. At one time, most were. separated what the Roman Catholics believe from any other belief. Okay? Remember that there are a lot of, of different Protestant groups. There's one Catholic group. At least that's what we hope for. Okay? And it's, it's, um, it codified, it solidified what it is that the Roman Catholics believe and what it is that Roman Catholics ought to do. Okay? Any other questions? Next week, really, in, 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 please come back and invite family, friends, and enemies to come. Um, Father Will Golden is going to go through the Easter Vigil with us. Will Golden and I remember started this series um, when, when uh, COVID-19 stopped it. And so he's, he's that guy. He's an awful lot of fun. And I promise next week will be very good. Thank you for attending this week. God bless.